Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final series of our workplace bullying and harassment series. It's been a four part series, and hopefully, most of you have been able to watch the previous series. However, if you haven't, please feel free to jump onto the AMPC web, um, YouTube channel and you'll be able to watch those presentations as well as our previous one, um, webinars that we've been conducting. So today we're lucky enough to have Simon Booth from Aegis Insurance here to talk about claims management in terms of bullying and harassment. Um, last week's webinar, we actually did a little poll to see how many people have had to deal with a workplace bullying issue. And unfortunately, the majority, the vast majority of uh, attendees have had to in some capacity. So hopefully the um, tips that Simon will give us today will help you avoid some of the claims and claims costs that you may incur on top of your insurance. And hopefully the other webinars have been able to give you some really good policies and procedures and ideas to go back and review what you've currently got in the workplace to minimise workplace bullying and harassment. If for anyone that's new, we do really encourage questions that uh, because of the nature of the topic, we will keep them confidential as, as in who's typed them. So we, we'll read the questions out throughout the presentation uh, so Simon can answer them as we go. But please feel free, use your toolbar um, and send in questions and we will hopefully be able to answer all of them. So once again, thanks to Simon for joining us today and I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you for having me again. Um, probably uh, <clears throat> to start straight off the bat as I try and get my computer to work for the first time. Here we go. Okay, we're on. Um, as you were saying, Amanda, just interrupt me if there are uh, questions that come through that people want to know about. Um, the other thing is with all the workbooks we've done, all the presentations we've done, and with mine today, you'll see a common theme, and that is preparation. That we need to actually put things in place. We can't have a situation and then go, oh, geez, wouldn't it have been great if we'd done this? If we'd done this, this wouldn't have happened, and we wouldn't be at fair work, or we wouldn't be uh, sitting there um, trying to manage a workers' compensation claim. So keep that in mind, and the whole aim for anything is to try and have the infrastructure already in place to help you deal with an event <coughs> so you don't have to wing it. <coughs> Excuse me, I've had a bit of a cough for a few um, weeks, so I will apologise. So what I want to do today is actually talk about five main areas. So in the workbook, you'll notice there's, there's a lot more content, but today we're just going to focus on five or we won't get through it. I, I can talk this topic all day, as Amanda knows. I want to look at what's the difference between fair work and workers' compensation, because this is where both employers and their workers get caught up sometimes. What do we look at when we're looking at liability for mental injury? How do we go about true early intervention to assist in claims that relate to mental injury? How do we engage the injured worker and the doctor to get better results when it comes to mental injury? Okay. And it's done again. There we go. So first thing to look at is fair work, and Andrew did a, a great job of defining this in his work in his uh, webinar. Takes a very different view uh, on bullying and uh, and what becomes a claim compared to workers' compensation. So in reality, workers' compensation doesn't care about the fair work definition of bullying and harassment. When we look at bullying for, under a fair work perspective, it has to be repeated, has to be unreasonable acts, and it has to cause a risk to health and safety. From a workers' compensation perspective, it's no fault. It can be one event, so it doesn't have to be that repeated component that comes into bullying and, and harassment. And it doesn't actually have to be an unreasonable act. It is the perception that the person had of the act and whether it was reasonable or unreasonable. Right. Then it's, did it cause an injury or illness? Did that result in incapacity and or the need for medical expenses? So the big things to look at here is things in the workplace that may not meet the legal definition of bullying and harassment can still lead to a claim for mental injury. And what we're going to look at when we talk about managing these claims is include those in there as well, not just the ones where there actually was bullying and harassment, but claims that haven't met that definition, but a claim has still been accepted or made. So 
So when we look at uh, liability for, uh, for mental injury, when we look at claims that actually come through because someone's claiming bullying harassment, we end up getting three, four main, main things. We get an actual bullying and harassment incident where it's been proven to meet the criteria and the person's lodged the claim. We also get workplace conflict. Two people in the workplace in conflict with each other, no bullying and harassment, but remember it's a no-fault scheme. So both of those parties, if they've actually had a reaction to the conflict, could lodge a claim for a mental injury. Then we have management action. So we see this a lot when we look at performance management. We see a lot of people who are being performance managed actually claim they're being bullied. Inside that, when we're running an investigation into bullying and harassment, we have to make sure we get the process right, and we'll talk about this a bit more in, in detail later, because we could have an alleged wrongdoer who is actually proven to have, uh, to have been bullying someone, but because we've messed up the process, they can lodge a claim, get an accepted claim, because the action that we took wasn't reasonable. When we look at what, um, uh, sorry, when we look at disputing liability, let's take out whether the, worker, the claim is a worker, let's leave that to the side. When we look at mental injury, we're going to look at four main areas. There was no injury or illness, the injury or illness is not work related, reasonable management action, and in Victoria and Queensland, the failure to disclose a pre existing injury. So when we look at no injury or no illness. What we're saying here is there never was an injury or illness, or if there was an injury or illness, that is now resolved. Often when we see people being performance managed, they'll actually go and lodge a claim for bullying, a claim for a, a alleged bullying harassment. And during the investigation process, they'll actually raise something from six, nine months ago, something that it doesn't fall inside the boundaries of reasonable management action. So we can say, yep, we're performance managing the person, this all meets the criteria for reasonable management action. But then they raise something that's historic. And we haven't tied that up in a management action because it wasn't and because it was so long ago. What we want to look at there is, has the person had a lot of annual leave? Or since that in, in incident they're talking about, they actually haven't had annual leave. They haven't had any time off uh, for, sick, uh, for sick leave. Clinical notes from the doctor showing that they actually didn't see the doctor about anything to do with that incident. What that does is does enable us to say there was no injury, but what we can do is a thing called limited acceptance. We can actually say, yes, we agree there might have been an, an injury at the time, that injury is resolved and therefore there's actually no costs that, that are associated with the claim. There's no incapacity, there's no ongoing medical entitlements. Okay, Whether if we go down the path of there is just no injury or illness, that's something that's going to be determined by an independent medical at the time. Uh, so the insurer, when someone lodges a claim, will actually send them off uh, to an independent doctor. That doctor rarely, but sometimes will come back and say, I've assessed the person and they do not have an injury. More likely, the doctor will say they do have an injury. And what we then look at is whether or not that injury is actually work-related. So with this, we look at two things. Firstly, what's going on in their personal life? So if they've got a mental injury and they're claiming they were being bullied, harassed or whatever in the workplace, is that actually the cause of their incapacity? Or is something going on in their personal life? Have they lost someone close to them? Have, are they having relationship problems? Are there issues with their family? Are there issues with their finances? You know, we know that financial strain causes a lot of pressure on people. On top of that, we take that a step further for, for point two, is do they have a pre-existing condition? Now, all this gets tied up. They might be being performance managed. They've claimed that they're being bullied. If we can show that there's actually something going on in their private life that is more likely to have caused this incapacity, it gives us a good argument. Step past that, we know that at any point in time, I think it's about 20% uh, of the population now, will be suffering some form of mental illness. Okay, And about 45% of the population will suffer some form of mental illness during their lifetime. So we also have to look at the fact that someone may have an ongoing psychological condition. If that's the case, often those conditions have a pattern. It might be that a person is hospitalised three or four times a year for their psychological injury. It might be that they consistently have periods where they can't attend work because of their psychological injury. 
and to date we've got a history of that but to date they've never lodged a claim or it might have been that they knew with us and they've lodged a claim on us but not on their previous employer if we can actually find the medical evidence to show that the person does have a cycle that every few months they are being hospitalized they do need time off for their condition we actually have a good argument to say that what is occurring is nothing that is outside of their normal condition and therefore it is not work related so things to look out for we do need to always make sure with our staff that we have some form of understanding of what is going on in their private lives because it does often lead to uh, some insight into what's going on when they do lodge mental injury claims reasonable management action now reasonable management action is is a tricky one it's not something you can go as i said before oh we're performance managing this person oh let's put the information to show we did that in now you actually have to put that in place at the start and when you're managing someone you follow it so if we look at a, a reasonable management action claim again your performance managing someone they've claimed bullying and harassment what the insurer is going to want to see is your policy what is your policy around performance management then what they're going to want to see is all your notes and correspondence to show that you followed that process so if we look at this there's no use having a policy and not following it so if you have if you've got a policy you didn't follow it chances are the insurer is going to actually accept the claim if we follow it we also have to ensure that the process itself was reasonable so we talk about reasonable management action in a reasonable manner so the policy itself must be reasonable and then the way that is actually uh, implemented by the manager or HR also must be reasonable and often we see someone conduct a process in line with the, the policy but they're demeaning and belittling as they go about it which means that a claim will arise not because the process was wrong but because of the manner in which the, the, the performance the management was actually conducted the other side here as I raised before when we're looking at an investigation into bullying and harassment that would be covered under reasonable management action but if the process is flawed so if we don't give people reasonable time time to respond all these sort of things allow a support person so we know at fair work we don't have to offer a support person uh, we can't deny someone a support person but we can't we don't have to offer it at workers compensation most insurers will accept a claim if you did not offer a support person so simple things like that that we need to make sure we're including into the system that go past what we're asked for by fair work okay um, so your policies procedures are important your note taking is extremely important in these situations and ensuring that whoever's doing the performance management actually has some interpersonal skills and more importantly ensuring that there's a witness at all of the meetings because that's the person who's going to be able to say it was done reasonably otherwise we have a he said she said argument and what we'll find in you know it is workers compensation when it's he said she said it'll more often than not lean towards the worker so a lot of employers get frustrated when someone goes to work for them with a pre-existing condition and they aggravate it and they have to wear the claim now unfortunately outside of Victoria and Queensland there's actually no uh, sections in the act to protect employers who do the right thing ask about pre-existing conditions and get lied to so in New South Wales someone can say that they don't have a bad back when they do go to work for you hurt their back and you will still have to wear the cost of that claim now you may have some re, uh, some repercussions you can apply based on uh, providing misleading information during employment that impacts on their employment but not on their claim and this is where it gets tricky so if you are in Victoria or Queensland my recommendation is looking at the act so in Victoria it's section 41 in Queensland it's section 571b and understanding what you can and can't ask how you must ask it and the information that you need to supply with that so you need to make sure that they have a, a very solid understanding of the role what the physical and psychological or cognitive components of that role are so if they understand that and then they say they don't have a pre-existing condition we have grounds to challenge the claim most of these uh, claims get up because the employer hasn't done the work if you don't do that work if you don't have that information available if you don't do it before you offer the person a role you're going to be in trouble 
The other part that uh, employers fall down on is they'll often uh, go down this uh, process. Someone will say, I'm fine to do the job. Then they change their job without asking them if there's going to be any issues with them performing that role. Or, as we see a lot, they don't change their job, but they ask them to do something that's not in their job. Now, if they're injured doing something not in their job, so it wasn't in the, the description you gave them uh, before they signed their declaration, or if you change their job and they're injured doing something that wasn't in that declaration, this argument does not stand. Excuse me. So we look at actually managing claims from mental injuries. So someone's lodged a claim for bullying and harassment, might not have met the definition, it doesn't matter, but they've, there was an incident, the claim gets accepted. What we need to understand overall, return to work rates are deteriorating. If we look at um, Victoria and New South Wales just in the last couple of years, their costs have blown out because of the failure to return people to work. All right? We know historically that we're getting worse. So what we then do is look at site claims. Site claims at the moment nationally make up about 6%. But a study recently from Victoria actually identified that their recent data has it at 14%. 14% of all claims in Victoria last year were site claims, mental injury claims. With that, they're also predicting that mental injury claims will increase by 34% in the next 10 years, where physical claims will only increase by 12%. So it's becoming more and more of a problem. On top of that, pardon me, um, we know that they're more expensive and we'll talk about how much more expensive they are in a minute. So what I want to do today, and I'm going to hit three areas just for time. We're going to talk about early intervention. We're going to talk about what you can do up front to try and contain a claim. We're going to talk about how to engage the injured worker and how to engage the treating doctor. Inside the workbook, you'll also find some information on what I call doing the work. So that is about how to assess the workplace, what you're looking for, uh, how you take that information, how you identify in capacity, and how you work with a doctor based on those things. Also has in the workbook identifying red flags, identifying those things that will tell you that a claim is going to be more difficult than what you would expect uh, of a normal claim. It, uh, one of the things we'll be doing uh, with, AM, uh, with AMPC going forward is actually doing a training on return to work. And with that, we intend to cover those bottom four points there. So expanding on what you do about assessing the workplace, expanding on how you identify and deal with people who are more difficult claimants, working on how to engage the insurer, and most importantly, working on proactive claims management. So how do we put strategies in place that will get you a positive outcome? So what do we know? We know site claims go for almost three times as long as physical claims. And we know, based on the last data that, that was released, that they cost almost two and a half times as much. We know that when we look at mental injury claims, the bulk of those claims relate to workplace bullying and work pressure. And when we look at work pressure, what we're talking about there, ironically, is interpersonal conflict, disciplinary actions, performance counselling. So if someone's actually getting a claim up for a discipline action or performance management, Obviously, it means that the employer hasn't done it correctly. So this is where we go back to that situation. If I say you're performance managing me and I accuse you of bullying me, if my claim gets accepted, isn't that giving me some v validity that yes, I was being bullied and not performance managed? So getting that process right, ensuring that your performance management is rock solid and is done in a reasonable manner uh, and as a reasonable process is extremely important to stop claims actually getting up that shouldn't be claims. So, what do we look at with early intervention? I want to look at a couple of things. You want to take control. You want to drive the process, because if you're not driving it, someone else is. And when, let's look at motivators. Your motivator, quite rightly, is generally to keep the cost of the premium down. How do we do that? By getting the person back to work. Good for the company, good for the worker. But what's the motivation of the worker? So if we're allowing the worker to actually drive the process, can we be certain that they're going to be focused on return to work? 
What about the doctor? What about the insurer? What are their motivators? So the insurer, depending on the state you're in, if you look at New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Queensland, it's not their money. They don't actually mind if they're spending the money because they've got other measures that they have to meet to make their to make profit themselves. So often their motivators can be at odds with yours. So if we're allowing them to drive the process, are we are you actually going to get the best outcome? Talk about having a process in place. Now, when we look at claims for bullying and harassment, so someone's lodged a, a, a claim with you saying I'm being bullied, you're doing the investigation. Obviously, as pointed out last week by Ken and Steve, you should have a process in place for that and the, they should have a workbook out to, uh, to you in the next week that will actually outline that process. But on top of that, you should have a process for how you deal with every claim. You should build some collateral. So we'll talk about that in a bit more detail, but collateral for workers, doctors, managers, the return to work coordinators and HR around how we go about managing claims and how we go about that process. And you should make sure that, as we talked about before, you're identifying those claimants that are at risk. <coughs> Excuse me. Those people that if we leave it to themselves and we don't drive a claim, will actually be on claim for a lengthy period of time. Engage the worker, and I'm going to go into that in depth later. It's probably the most important part of the return to work process or a claim process is getting the worker on site. Identify the trigger. So if we're talking about a mental injury claim here, what is it that's going to trigger the, a reaction from them? What are the restrictions? And based on that, what are the alternative duties? So how do we keep that person safe? And then if we've got that information, engaging the doctor and getting them on site, the doctor, the psychologist, the psychiatrist, whoever's working with us on this mental injury claim. And this should be done through the process of the investigation. So whether it's the investigation of the bullying harassment or whether it's the investigation if we're pending the claim. Don't sit around and wait for the liability outcome or for the end of the investigation. Actually work with that person to keep them at work now and after that, after the outcome. You know, what we don't want is someone going home. We know once someone's off work, it's hard to get them back work, to work. We know if someone's off for 45 days, the chance of getting them back is only 50%. So if we can keep them at work and if we can keep them engaged, the chances are, regardless of the outcome of the investigation, that we can minimise the cost of a claim. Right? Respond. Now, I'll talk about this in a bit more detail later, but you need to make sure that you actually, you know, when someone lodges a claim, you actually talk to them. And I'll, as I said, I'll go through that in a bit more depth later on. Investigate. The number of people who say, oh, someone made a, made a complaint, we didn't believe them, but did you investigate? Now, if I'm a worker and I've lodged a complaint with you and you don't investigate and I lodge a claim because you didn't investigate, it's likely to get up. Uh, aligning expectations is a big one. Uh, when I was a psychologist, I used to do EAP and I saw a number of people who were sent to me after they made an allegation of bullying and harassment. And pretty much every one of those people had an expectation that the person they'd made the allegations against would be terminated. And we all know that the chance, that circumstances that would lead to the ability to terminate someone are not that uh, often. So normally it would be counselling, maybe some form of training. It's very rare that someone would be terminated. Okay. Understand the signs and symptoms. So when we look at the, you know, the two major uh, conditions that people claim, it's depression and anxiety, or a mixture of depression and anxiety. What we want to do is we want to understand them because if we're talking to a doctor and we understand the symptoms and we understand what the person's going through, A, we can show some empathy, but we can also talk the doctor with, uh, actually educate the doctor because often the doctors are doing the wrong thing. If we look here, symptoms of depression, social withdrawal, being alone, stopping hobbies, anxiety, being shy, avoiding people, social withdrawal, oversleeping. All these things about withdrawing. And what we know is depression and anxiety actually feed on withdrawal and, and, and inactivity. That if someone's depressed, they want to withdraw. So why would we reinforce a symptom? And that's where a lot of GPs don't understand. They put someone off work, which is actually going to make the condition worse, instead of working with an employer to get the person back to work and improve their actual condition. 
And we'll talk a bit later on about why doctors go down that path. And it's not because they're awful. It's not because they're, they're incompetent. There are some very genuine reasons behind it. Most of all, when we start to engage the injured worker, when we start to look at the workers' comp, uh, the return of process, don't leave it to your insurer, okay? If we leave it to the insurer, they'll focus on what's good for them. And on top of that, we know turnover. Turnover in New South Wales was well above 30%. In Victoria, going about five years ago, turnover of case managers was 38%. So you're also going to struggle with that continuity of someone dealing with your injured worker. Who knows your business better than you? Who knows your workers better than you? Who actually cares about both your business and workers more than you do? So if that's the case, why would we say to an insurer, okay, well, you just let me know what's going on and tell me what I've got to do? We should be driving that ourselves. Okay. So I talked before about <clears throat> the importance of responding to the worker <clears throat> and the importance of investigating. Now, I had an issue years ago where I'd gone to see a company with the hope of picking them up as a client, which didn't work out. They would spent a fortune on all these fancy policies and procedures, and they thought, we don't need anyone. We've got all of these. Great. Lo and behold, four weeks later, we get a phone call. We had someone make an allegation with Pauline. Okay. They sent it to me. It was not just an allegation. It was a 20-page document actually identifying all the instances and what had happened. And I said to them, do you believe it? Well, yes, we do. Okay. What have you done? Oh, well, I said, yes. Well, we got the complaint two weeks ago. Okay. And this week, our lawyer drafted a response. Now, Andrew Douglas will tell you <laughs> there are a number of occasions that you don't want a lawyer involved. And this is one of them. Your response to someone coming to you and saying that for the past 18 months I've been bullied and harassed by my manager should not be A, silence for two weeks, and then B, a response from your lawyer. How supported do you think that person felt at that point in time? All right. The response is not, obviously, I, I refer a lot to what my dad taught me when uh, I was, he was teaching me to drive. He said, if you're ever in a car accident, Never get out and say, I'm sorry. Never admit, admit fault. Same in this situation. We're not going to sit there and say, oh, I'm sorry this has happened to you. But we can say we're sorry that they feel this has happened because obviously we need to investigate. All right? The investigation is important for a few reasons. A, we need to understand whether it's happened. From a liability perspective, if we investigate and find out that none of what's been said has occurred, it gives us a very strong argument to have the claim declined. More importantly, by investigating, we're actually giving some credence to the person's allegations. We're actually not saying to them, you'll be fine, go away. We're saying we're taking this seriously and we're going to investigate. And as Ken and uh, Steve raised last week, you need to look at the, you know, how serious these investigations, uh, the allegations are, the level of, I guess, where they sit on um, uh, severity, and whether that investigation should be done internally or externally. And again, these are all things that actually show the worker that we're taking this seriously. But if we're not doing these things, how does the worker feel? Worse for this company in, in this situation, I actually said to them, well, you showed me a whole lot of policies and procedures the other day. Do you have a policy on bullying and harassment? The guy shuffles around a bit and he goes, yep, here it is. I said, have you opened it? Have you actually followed it? And he looked at me like he was shocked. Like, no, we haven't. We haven't. Well, why do you have a policy if you're not going to use it? No one was aware of the policy. So what was the point in having it in the first place? But why? And the policy, uh, because we read it, definitely did not say you do nothing for two weeks and have a lawyer respond. Right? It was quite humanised. So when we look at this, we're not going to engage with a worker and keep them on side if we're throwing a lawyer in front of them or we're ignoring their allegations. Excuse me. Oh. Sounds silly, but communicate. Communicate early and often. All right? Don't communicate at the start and then ignore the worker because they're going to be sitting there going, what's going on? 
I've raised these concerns and just like before they were thinking, the company's not taking it seriously. Also, don't just communicate about the investigation, communicate about return to work. So how are we making the workplace safe for this person? If they've, you know, say Amanda works for me and Amanda's made an allegation that I'm a bully, are we going to send Amanda back to work directly for me, sitting in a chair opposite me uh, while the investigation is going on? I wouldn't feel extreme, or she probably wouldn't feel extremely safe if that was the case. So keep the worker engaged, keep showing them that you care, and keep communicating on where are we going to put you, what are we going to do, get their ideas, get their buy into those things. And where possible, if they've made a request, follow it. Because once again, we're showing them that we want to work with them. All right. Educate. Now, this is important. People who generally make a complaint for bullying generally aren't aware of what the process is going to be after they make that, uh, that allegation. So actually explaining to the person what the process is, explaining how it's going to run, explaining what some of the intricacies are, um, oh, pardon me, discussing their expectations, it's a big one. We often tell them of the process, send them out. Not actually having a chat with them about what's the likelihood of certain things happening at the end of this. What's, what's more likely to happen than not? What are they expecting is going to happen? If we can actually set the expectations up the front, we don't set them up to be confused and disappointed when the investigation finishes a week, two weeks or four weeks later. Right? On top of that, often we have people who have now made the complaint so they go out and they tell everyone, I've made a complaint about this person, they've been mean to me, and they're going to get sacked. And as I said before, when I, you know, the, the people I, I used to see when I was doing counselling, every single one of them expected the person would be sacked. And how do you feel if you've been going around for a month saying, I've made these allegations to this person because they're mean to me, and they're going to get sacked, and then they don't get sacked? You've built that up as the only outcome in your mind as to how you know, the, I will feel justified from this. Not only that, you're now embarrassed because you've told everyone this is what's going to happen. And what we see a lot is people going off work after the investigation, not necessarily because of the, the bullying, but because of the outcome of the investigation. So if we can manage those expectations up front, we can actually try and decrease the number of people that will go off after the investigation is finished. So, from an education perspective too, I believe employers should actually develop a pack for injured workers on workers' compensation. So if we look at it, workers' compensation is a, it's a complex uh, system, right? When do people's benefits drop? What do they drop to? How long uh, does, that, does the actual system work for? Right? Um, who's the contact? Who do I talk to at my employer about these things? Who's my insurer? Who should I be talking to? Um, what are my obligations? These are things that we're finding more and more when we're talking to our clients are no longer being discussed with, with workers. So what we think is a great idea is a, a written letter in plain English that outlines a lot of this information. On top of that, when we've actually put this information together, uh, the letter together, attaching some information. So every regulator's website has uh, injured worker guides. Grab those, put them in the pack. Certain states have legislative information you must give a worker who, who lodges a claim or says they're injured. So in Victoria, there's the return to work information that must be provided. In Tasmania, there's information that must be provided outlining the person's right to claim. Okay? So making sure that you have those things and you give them to the person. Information, and, we, and again, you can get this off the regulator work, websites, on how pre injury earnings are calculated. That is an argument we see a lot, where the worker's expectation on what was included is not aligned with what is actual reality. So if you're giving them that up front, A, hopefully it stops the arguments, but B, it gives you something that you can both talk to. So if issues arise, you can go back to your letter, you can go back to the injured worker guide, you can go back to the PR information and both talk to that, as opposed to you saying something and the worker just disagreeing. The other thing to look at is, are there relevant policies that people have uh, in place, whether it's a return to work policy, whether injury management policy, that relates to the return to work process? 
give them that so they understand again what the employer is committing to do and what everyone's obligations are. Now, coordinate. Now this we're looking at coordinating with your managers, the workers' doctor and the worker about suitable duties, about what they're capable of doing, about the hours they can work. Keep those things, those discussions going, and make it happen. So if the doctor or worker asks for something as part of this, and it's not unreasonable, make it happen. Again, we want to engage that worker. We want to keep them at work. So the more we're willing to show the doctor and the worker that we want to work with them, the more likely they are to support what we're trying to do. Update. So through the process, there's often a lot of delays. So there's investigations going on, there's witnesses being interviewed. Touching base with the worker and letting them know what's occurred, obviously not giving away any confidential information, and where you're up to in the process and what your expected finish date is will actually help keep the worker focused. All right? Um, the other thing there is if we're updating them, they don't make things up. What do we know? We see it a lot with change in an organisation. Things are announced, but there's not, not a lot of information goes out, and the rumour mill starts. You know, all of a sudden, it's not you know, uh, you know, ten percent of the workforce is being made redundant. It's the entire place is shutting down and going offshore. Same thing here. If we don't keep people updated, they're going to start making up what's going on, and this is the same for the alleged wrongdoer. So the person that the complaints have been made about. Remember. Innocent until proven guilty. So these people might have not done anything wrong, but are now becoming stressed because they think they're going to lose their job over a, a, a vexatious complaint. So keeping them up to speed on what's going on, and also, as we said before, at the start of it all, letting them know the process, letting them know the probable outcomes. Okay. So when dealing with the injured worker, key points, take their allegations seriously, demonstrate empathy, Take a non adversarial approach. So, not taking sides, you're there to, to as a return of a coordinator, to actually assist them through the, the uh, return of a process. Get involved and take action. So, drive the process and get things moving. Push the insurer, push the doctor, push the worker appropriately, and push internally with management or supervisors to get duties. Provide relevant information on what's going on with the process. Align expectations with the scheme. Um, and make sure your attitude is above impeach. Uh, what we know is people in the process, whether it's the doctor, whether it's the worker, or whether it's a, re a uh, conciliation hearing, will look at the employer's behaviour. And I'll talk about how this impacts on uh, doctors, especially in a minute. But if you're shown to do everything, they're more likely to work with you. If you're shown to be uh, a little bit uh, to frustrate the actual process, they're probably going to actually frustrate it back. So let's look at treating doctors. Look, and I'm probably to blame as much as everyone. We give a lot of GPs a bad rap when it comes to workers' compensation. But what are the barriers? So if we look at the barriers that affect us when it comes to doctors, look at time. So what we know is the doctors don't get paid as much to see someone on workers' compensation, but the people they see generally take more time than the guy with the runny nose sitting in the, um, the uh, waiting room. Knowledge. A study was done that showed only three, uh, th on average, 3% of a doctor's patients are actually workers' compensation patients. Okay? So they're probably not dealing with this that much to be that au fait with the system. All right? Also, knowledge of injuries. So if we look at it, what do doctors generally do when someone's got you know, a severe knee injury or a severe ankle injury or back injury? They refer on to a specialist. Right? Same, you know, generally with a psych injury, mental injury, they'll refer on to a psychologist or a psychiatrist. But at the end of the day, the GPs generally left still signing the certificates, trying to understand what the person can and can't do. One of the biggest barriers is mistrust. And WorkSafe Victoria actually did a study with doctors looking at uh, what they called uh, non-complying doctors. And what they found out was quite interesting. They found that only 41% of doctors actually believe an employer wants an injured worker back at work. 
only 27% of doctors believe that an employee will stick to the restrictions that they provide. And only 22% of doctors had confidence in the return to work coordinator. So that doesn't give us a very good picture uh, on doctors' trust of us and the process. The other one, which is probably comes because of mistrust, is the doctor becomes an advocate. So they actually feel that the work is hard done by, especially when we start talking bullying and harassment, and they advocate for the worker. So instead of uh, actually treating them and keeping that uh, doctor-patient uh, distance, they actually start to protect the worker. And that adds a whole level of uh, complexity to a return to work. So how do we overcome the time barrier? It's not that hard. One of the first things we do is actually ask them, how would you like us to communicate with you? Some doctors might say, look, I'd rather have a five minute phone call with you. Others might say, look, could you actually put it in writing? I, I do all my uh, written correspondence at the end of the day or at the end of the week, and I'll get it back to you at that point in time. But be prepared. So don't call the doctor expecting to have a chat, all right, because he's not your friend, right? If you are concise, if you are to the point and you actually give the doctor information they need, support them at the same time, and allow them to get on with earning money, which is what they're there to do, they're more likely to take your phone calls because they know you're not going to be wasting their time. Right. The knowledge barrier, a bit hard. Once again, a letter. So when we're talking knowledge here too, let's talk about knowledge of your workplace because they don't know about your workplace and the only information they're getting is from a worker. And in this situation, if we're talking, you know, following a claim for bullying and harassment, the worker is telling them that it's a horrible place to work. So how do we change that? We need to educate the doctor. We need actually, you know, and I'm a big fan of sending them something in writing that outlines your commitment to return to work, how you understand being back at work is better for the, for the, the worker. Um, if there is still an investigation process going on, actually give the doctor the information about how that process works so they can understand what's going on and can be used to reinforce with the worker if the worker starts to get anxious about the process. Actually get the, um, uh, identify what the worker can and can't do at work from them. So if the doc say, oh, they can do this, well, that's not actually a realistic doc. Here are the things that we have available. Here are the places we can move the worker. Can you have a chat and see, see what, they, uh, what they think about that? Also, we go back to those symptoms we raised before. Actually reinforcing with the doctor that being at work is better for the worker. All right, that if the worker goes home, especially if they're depressed and anxious, it's actually going to make things worse and getting the person out of that cycle is going to be very difficult. All right? But again, saying that from a I care perspective, not you'll do what I say perspective to the doctor. All right. um, mistrust. So here, I know it sounds silly, but show them that you care. So when you call up, actually saying, you know, the workers doesn't seem to be doing very well, how are they coming across to you, as opposed to the first comment being, how do I get them back to work? I've got duties. Okay? Show them you care about your workers' well-being. Right? Be engaged when you're talking to them. Actually listen to what they've got to say and respond. Right? One of my biggest things is don't argue. We see it all the time. Right? We see people arguing with a doctor. Now, if we take it from this perspective, if I have gone to my doctor and said, my, my employer is, is a bully and it's a terrible place to work, and then someone from the employer calls and argues with my doctor and dictates to my doctor, what message does that send to my doctor? Everything I've just said about that workplace is true because this guy's being aggressive with the doctor. All right. So when we talk about how you come across and how you present yourself is important to the process. Okay. Always in these situations, reinforce with the doctor what you're doing to make the workplace safe. What are we doing to actually ensure that it's safe for the worker to be there? We've moved the worker to a different part of the building or we've put them to a different location so they're not near the person that they're having the issues with or they've made the allegations against. But I uh, assisted a friend years ago who was being bullied. Uh, the company did an investigation. And instead of coming and saying, here's what we've done to make it safe, they've said, it's now safe, you can go back. And we asked the question, well, what have you done? 
I would not prepared to tell you that. So again, what does that send? What message does that send to a doctor or a worker about the employer? Something horrible must have been going on if you're not even prepared to tell me what you've done to make it safe. And it shouldn't be that hard, really, should it, for an employer to say, these are the things that we've put in place to ensure your safety in the workplace. Advocacy. So once again, here we go back to mistrust. So if there's mistrust, which leads to them becoming an advocate, we need to build trust, right? As I said before, we don't argue, we don't dictate. And more importantly, if there's something that the doctor's not able to get through the insurer and it's reasonable, we go to bat for the doctor. We call the insurer, and I've seen this a few times, we've gone to bat, the insurer's going to do it anyway. But we call the, the doctor back and say, just got off the phone with the insurer and this has now been approved, right? Makes you look like you're helping them out, which you should be anyway, because if they get what the doctor wants done quicker, the worker's probably going to come back to work. Again, always within reason. All right, so actually trying to show that you can be of assistance, actually showing you care and actually working with the doctor should I hopefully overcome that advocacy issue where they're actually trying to protect their worker. Okay, so running well on time here. So if we look at the key points, keep your interactions brief, be concise and to the point, get the doctor engaged in the return to work process, ask them for advice. Give them that respect. Get them to provide solutions. Right? If they're part of building the solution, they're more likely to actually sign off on it. Help them facilitate outcomes with the insurer. Keep them on side. Don't argue. Don't dictate. And most importantly and consistently, show them that you care. And that's it, Amanda. Wonderful. Thank you. So we do have a we do have a question. Let me just see if I can pull it up larger on my screen. What obligation does the doctor have to talk to you about the employee? It depends on the state. So if we look at New South Wales, the treating doctor is agreeing to be part of the process, so they're a nominated treating doctor. In other states, look. They're meant to be part of the process, but you'll find the insurer will rarely push that fact. What you need to try and identify is why won't they talk to you? And is it because they're busy? Uh, and often talking to the practice manager be, can be a good uh, uh, process here. And actually talking to the practice manager and say, look, really need to communicate with Dr. Such and Such. What can you what can you suggest? And it might be something in writing. You know, we, we get our clients often have a letter talking about how we really want to support the worker, all those sort of things. But then with a list of the suitable duties and some ticker boxes. So once again, making it easy for that doctor. Uh, the other thing is a lot of doctors have been burnt by the insurers not paying, all these sort of things. So taking that into consideration. Um, but if it's the case, talk to your insurer. Sorry, my wife's just come home and the dog is very happy. Um, talk to your insurer, see what leverage they can put in there. Um, but you know, a lot of states uh, at the moment are quite lenient on the doctor not actually engaging, and that's that's a, a, a big problem. Uh, so it's how you try and get those first couple of engagements and how you build that rapport that is going to be very important. Thanks for that, Simon. And at this stage, you have no other questions. So um, everyone will get a bit of an early mark today. So once again, we thank um, Simon and the Aegis team, as well as AMIC for putting on this series of presentations. We hope everyone's found it very valuable. I know the feedback that I have received so far has been very positive, um, that people have been able to use it, a number of the video or webinars as training resources that they've been able to send around to their teams internally. We will, as Simon mentioned, get you his workbook that will go out tomorrow with a copy of the webinar. And the webinar will also be put up onto our YouTube channel. And hopefully early next week, we'll get you the uh, booklet from last week's webinar that was presented by AMIC as well. So once again, thanks very much, Simon. Oh, sorry, Simon, what, yeah. Sorry, let's, let's not forget FCW lawyers as well. Andrew always does a great job for us. Absolutely, and, uh, sorry, yes, this is an oversight on my behalf. Yes, Andrew is fantastic. Anyone's had the chance to listen to him, he has done a fantastic job in 
uh, the presentations that he has done for us during these series. Yeah, and the other thing is, uh, obviously, ANPC has made available the, the helpline or the, the advisory line for uh, uh, 12 months. So numbers up on the screen. If people have questions about any of the things that we've been discussing in this series, uh, call that number and there'll be someone there who can assist them. Great. And I've just had a comment come through. You'll probably guess who it is. Is Simon as good as he sounds? And yes, I can recommend if you do have any um, questions that uh, you want, please feel free to ring Simon. He'll point you in the right direction, give you advice in terms of um, who to speak to or if it's to specific to do with your claims, etc. He'll be able to help you in that space. So thanks very much for that. And I just wanted to do, do that plug around the Workplace Advisory Line. As Simon said, that's a 12 month initiative we're running to see if it is worthwhile um, to continue on for our membership. Came out of the first project that was conducted by AMIC to the, and one of the findings was that people just often wanted that second opinion. So you may have gone to your insurer or you may have gone to your legals or somebody like that, but sometimes, you know, your gut just says, I want another opinion. That's exactly what you'll be able to use this workplace advisory line for. So you'll either be speaking to someone from the team at Aegis or if it's a HR IR matter, you'll be referred through to AMIC um, and it's open for all AMPC members to be able to access. Just next week, the webinar is on UV sterilisation and meat processing. So we're gonna change and flip the topic completely. So we're gonna be looking at everything from air filtration to cleaning belts to sterilising knives, um, you name it. I think they're gonna cover it in this, the next webinar on UV sterilisation and the applications of UV in the meat industry. So thanks Simon and thanks to everyone that attended today. Enjoy your afternoon. Thanks, Matt. Bye.